Hey guys, and welcome to Portraits of Greatness, episode 8. I'm here with Rashid, as always, and we're going to talk about Luther, some Knox. We'll see how much John Knox we fit in at the end, and then more widely, Hero as Priest, which is this fourth of Carlisle's six lectures on hero, hero worship, and the heroic in history. How are you, Rashid? Uh, just fine. How are you? Yeah, good. It's an interesting one he's picked up on here, um, Carlisle. And Emerson has no kind of equivalent. We were trying to think about it. How much does this relate to Swedenborg or the chapters uh, on mysticism and Emerson? Parallels, I think I found yeah. some parallels because uh, there is a quote that's almost uh, what Emerson was talking about. You know, we had a whole discussion in the Emerson Swedenborg chapter about how uh, Emerson was sort of putting Swedenborg above poets and uh, I believe philosophers in a sense as a mystic he's, he was saying that you know these people are where you get the real light the intense light and Carlyle sort of echoes this in the quote that I have here I believe he says Okay, the mild shining light, uh, the mild shining of the poet's light has to give place to the fierce lightning of the reformer. So these are kind of echoing this notion from Emerson. Yeah, he's trying to guide us from where we were with poetry. And he's, he's kind of, he, he's trying to come up with the language here of, I want to reinsert the firebrand. <laughs> and, the, and he does kind of admit that there are elements of the priest that is like the prophet. So yeah. a priest is a kind of prophet, a believer in divine truth of things, and presides over a worship of people are sort of similarities he gives us early on. Uh, a yeah, uniter well, of the unseen holy and the, a spiritual captain of the people. Um, yeah. Where, where do you think then he, why did he decide to do this first? Um, see, is, is he just re regurgitating elements of prophet here? Or, or what possessed him to give it its own passage on Luther? I think I have my own reasons. I can kind of save that as we flesh well, it out. But. Yeah, uh, I, from what I gathered from it, he was sort of making the point that, okay, the priest is not a prophet in a sense because he, is, um, he has less authority than a prophet. He makes this point, I believe, right when he is beginning to introduce the notion of a priest and he says you know uh he obviously he's not a shining light fountain like a, a prophet but he, he has his importance in the modern era and i think the reason he's pushing the sort of priest uh forward as a religious figure when he's already done the prophet is because you know just what he said about the prophet when we were talking about i believe uh the poet he said uh, he was putting forth the idea that okay but we're not we're past the point of we're gonna, just gonna believe a guy is a prophet who is talking to god himself directly so in in a sense he's uh introducing a modern notion of a religious hero i that's what i uh took from the way he is uh moving forth with the priest even though he admits that the priest in a sense is not um is not someone divinely like appointed in a sense. He is someone who sees truth and who believes in truth and will share his tr truth, with, truth with the world, whether it be by uh, soft means or violent means. Uh, I think he made that point in Muhammad as well. You know, he says that uh, a person who knows the truth will share it, whether through uh, word of mouth or through the sword. So in a sense, he is very open to the idea of sharing the truth, whatever way you see him uh, effective or uh, suitable. So that's how I took it as the, how he was uh, relating it to the prophet. What did you, uh, what were your findings on the matter? Yeah, I think, I think it's it's strange though with Luther because he he genuinely does believe he sees the devil in in his room while he's writing and I think he throws an ink blot or something at it and there's a stain on a wall in a castle in Coburg which is meant to be the stain where he, he threw this at the devil which he genuinely thought he saw so there was interaction there um in his mind but he doesn't ever call himself a prophet he isn't mainly a reformer and we can get into this conception of how priests in Carlyle's opinion ref are reformers which just seems a bit strange because you think of the parish priest think of someone who's he's meant to be 
a leader of a sort of flock on a low level, some of the cons uh, console in, you know, you give your confession to a priest. This seems very different to how Carlyle's talking about it when he's like, a priest is a reformer and Luther and Knox were by express vocation priests. And again, we're getting into that Carlyle conception of like the express vocation, the labor. What were you born to do? These, and so when he talks about priesthood, he's, I don't think he's talking about that low level, uh, you know, parish. Yeah person so somebody can, can uh, console in he's talking about a firebrand he's talking about so his definition of priest is a bit jarring i think but he is talking about someone yeah. who has a zeal to reform a religious practice namely that they see to become sort of corrupt or decadent mm -hmm. uh, and if we take yeah, that so meaning we can run with his idea and we just kind of step back from the whole idea that, okay, this clearly doesn't encompass what most people see as priest, but let's go with it, Carlisle. Let's, let's go with you, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, uh, Carlisle definitely has, I think both Carlisle and Emerson sort of puts forth the ideas of different, the way we usually associate something like a priest, which I usually associate, and I believe you too, like with someone who upholds the rules and will uh, is simply someone that will tell you to like uh, be a regular, helpful member of the society. We don't sort really of low low of, level moral guidance sort of yeah. figure. Yeah, yeah. We uh, when we think of a prophet, we think of someone who like tapples statues, uh, someone who goes against the king, someone who uh, br uh, brings everyone back from a section of hell. We associate all these extreme things with a prophet, but with a priest, the best thing we think of is like an advisor to a king or someone like that. That's the highest they'll go. I don't think like, even when you're thinking of, thinking of the modern pope, uh, we're not thinking of modern pope as this mystical figure. We're thinking of him in mostly a political sense. You know, he's the king of technically the head of uh, Rome, which is a big, uh, big destination, both tourist, uh, both as a tourist attraction and as a religious, uh, as a religious um, monument. So uh, in that sense, he is definitely like pushing forward the idea of the priest as something completely different than what people usually associate with it and uh, how he relates it to the reformer is very interesting in my opinion he believes that if you're a reformer but you're not in a sense a carlylean pre uh, priest in the sense that you believe you have a truth in your mind and you believe in it wholeheartedly it's like uh it's almost innate in your nature like it's in your nature it's it's not something you've uh, been given but you understand the truth about how things work and will do whatever's in your power to see it through and in that sense every reformer is a priest for in a sense truth that's how i understood that whole uh, dichotomy of the priest as the reformer I'm not sure why, like he went with priest uh, in the sense, just because Luther was a priest in himself. It sort of seems a bit arbitrary to to me, the choosing of the priest, uh, the profession of a priest. I think it's like a profession. It's not even like uh, because of the vocation. Obviously, a prophet is in a profession, you know. But a priest, you can say I'm a priest, but you cannot say I'm a prophet without like drawing some. You could say you're a poet, though. So. Yeah. Uh, you, I can say I'm a poet, uh, and, and that that would be a profession too. I think, uh, in some senses, now, obviously a harder profession to get into than most professions, but you can still say I'm a poet. But you know, that's uh, it is interesting that he is giving like a moral precedence to a whole uh, a job in a sense, you know, an occupation mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> as something, someone who follows the truth. Yeah, I found that interesting. It's kind of like what he was saying in the poet chapter about the true poet uh, and the false poets. And he says the false poets are unbearable, but the true poet, the one who sees the truth in almost like, uh, admittedly in a milder light than the priest, uh, is someone who can, uh, someone who embodies that sense of the poet. And in that sense, somebody who embodies the sense of the priest is a reformer. I found that interesting. Uh, a thing that I noticed about this chapter uh, was 
<laughs> so previously, Carlyle made the point that heroes are not a product of their times. If they were a product of their times, they would come whenever the time needed it. But since they don't come every single time that they were needed, they're not a product of their times. Uh, they are individual forces that are here to change uh, the world. And now, Carlisle makes the point that, you know, sometimes think I think heroes are products of their times. They're sort of like the end point of the times. So I'll just quickly quote it, and then we will, uh, we will yeah, sure. share our thoughts on uh, what he's actually saying. Okay. Okay, there it is. Nay, the finished poet, I remark sometimes, is a symptom that his epoch itself has reached perfection and is finished. That before long there will be a new epoch, new reformers indeed. He's sort, of, he's sort of making the point early on about how reformers and poets are connected because they are both sort of uh, bringing in a whole new set of ideas born from their innate talents. And he's saying that uh, in the end you can sort of see it as a symptom of the times, the poet. So that sort of felt like going against what he said in the very first chapter. What did you think? Yeah, well, there's a whole thing about, okay, so we said in the last one we were going to do Cromwell, and then we kind of went through who we had left, and we and we decided we'd go this lecture, which is the priest, mm -hmm. and then we'll do Cromwell. And then we're going to do lecture five, which is uh, Man of Letters, Voltaire, Rousseau, he, he spent some time on Dr. Johnson as well, and then we'll go Napoleon. And the reason we're doing that is because Carlos, right now, starting with this lecture four, starts with this sort of mode of thinker, create, see something decadent through his thought process, almost un unleashes chaos, and then it comes back full circle in the mode of a king. Now, he puts uh, Cromwell and Napoleon both together in the final sixth lecture. We'll spit them out because we're going to go the theory that unleashes the chaos, i.e. Luther's pro Protestantism, and then the king figure that reconciles it back in Carlyle's mind is Cromwell. And then, and then similarly for the Enlightenment, you get Enlightenment thought and then Napoleon. So he does start to think of these modes where the greatness is fitting a larger structure. You can think of it that way which jars, of course, with what he said earlier. Um, I think I think what he, to, to try and square it, you're right, I read, I read it, and I was kind of like, you're going back on yourself a little bit there. But what, he's, what he tried to say earlier, and perhaps, was there will be these theories, right? Things will become decadent, right? Without any great hero or reformer to do something to them. And then sometimes the reformer, that initial reformer, the, the beginning of a new phase, will unleash energies that he himself is not entirely in control of. So there, there, you can't say here he's talking about two different classes of hero. The one is a Luther or a Johnson who are kind of prick at something and then kind of unleash what's wrong with it, but they, they're no, they, they won't be the ones to contain it ultimately. And the ones who contain it ultimately will be the king, the hero as king. Now, how that hero as king finally contains what's unleashed is where the time doesn't call it forth. Because you could have the hero as king reconciliation happen in 20 years, or you could have you could have it happen in 80 years or 100 years, I think. And that's where he's saying the time doesn't call it forth, because once you've unleashed chaos, it is inevitable that a king will come in to restore that, but it's not inevitable at the, the moment in which that will happen. That's where I'm kind of trying to reconcile that, if that mm. makes sense. So, in a sense, that there will be one eventually, but time doesn't decide that. It simply is uh, basically kind of like uh, how rain falls in seasons. And that's the only thing I can like uh, compare it to because yeah, well, you he, know that he likes the rain's going to fall in the, you know, uh, in the fall and in the spring, but you don't know when it's going to fall and you can't exactly pinpoint it. But he, he's sort of making the point that it is, an, it is kind of a natural process because, you know, in order for the human nature to prevail, that there'll need to be a hero. But it's not... Uh, 
it's not put forth by the times in the way that some uh, people think. Like if I save, like let's say there's a big crisis and I save it within the first year of the crisis, I'm a hero in Carla sense. But if, the, if I'm not there and someone else saves it in 15 years, that guy's a hero. But it's not, uh, our individual powers are different and we were both and there was no not formula. a part of the time. That's Im there were no What's important formula. is there's no, no yeah. one man sits and knows the formula because Carlyle hates this. He doesn't, I, th I don't think he minds like there being a natural formula that is like this, it's something, well, I don't want to go into mysticism. <laughs> I don't want to go full Swedenborg, but it's, there's something mystical universe. It's, it's that universal energy that will make these natural laws, but he hates it when one person sitting at a desk looks at a piece of paper and goes, I, I've got the formula for it now. That's what he abhors. Yeah, he um, goes into quite a detail on the doers in this yeah. chapter. More than the and you see it in the French Revolution as well. They they believe they have this formula for the constitution, and again and again, Carlyle is going, "This make it march, right? You have the constitution on paper, make it march. You can't do it. You know there are certain natural forces which will make things march, and the this recompense of the hero's king is one of them in Carlyle's mind." Yeah, and I think Carlyle's whole, his constant dipping into pantheism and like this whole uh, unifying nature of things is probably why he was so uh, interesting to the American transcendentalist and why he was a big friend of Emerson's too. If he was just a Calvinist uh, sort of. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely what Emerson latches on to, I think. From yeah. Him. yeah. Yeah. So I have to, that, that, to kick us off a little bit, right? I have this yeah. quote. Here do I. That he says, when belief waxes uncertain, practice becomes unsound. And he says that events happening at the beginning of the 16th century leading into Luther is this belief becoming uncertain, the finding of the new world. And he goes on this length to say, yeah, you didn't find Garden of Eden over there, did you? You didn't find Dante's uh, hell. Again, he's trying to link it back to the poetry, he said. And he said, Dante's sublime Catholicism, incredible now in theory, and defaced still worse by faithless doubting and dishonest practice has to be torn asunder by a Luther. Shakespeare's noble feudalism, as beautiful as once looked and was, has to end in a French Revolution. The accumulation of offenses is, as we say, to literally exploded, blasted asunder volcanically, and there are long, troublous periods before matters come to a settlement again. Sort of a quotation of what I was getting at there, but what was interesting was he believed that the waxing uncertainty of the belief was was twinned with this discovery of the new world, and also the uh, you know the attacks upon geocentrism, that the Earth was in the center of the universe, um, and you know Galileo, Copernicus, and this sort of stuff. Though Galileo cements it much later than Luther, the, the beginning of these milieus were happening, all coalescing at the time of Luther. Um, did you have anything on that? This idea that there, they saw the new world, there was no Eden? Because you also think, can think of that discovery of the new world just to simply look for a trade route to India. It was, it was a small branch of people who ever thought there'd be an Eden or something out there, right? Yeah, uh, I think what he... Carlyle is sort of on a modern, modernization route almost in, these, in this chapter compared to the last ones, uh, especially compared to the first two chapters where he was basically going around with the divination and uh, messages from God. But now he's, trying, he's starting to like, uh, talk about things like the Reformation, about how uh, written things might not be exactly as they were written, and there might be leeways that we can take about religion. And in a sense, Carlyle, uh, when he's first talking about this, he, he's kind of lamenting on the side about what might be lost when it comes to Reformation. He says he does not believe that Reformation is bad, because in the end, it was an in inevitable thing to begin with. It wasn't not going to happen. Uh, this sort of uh, relates back to what you were saying. Uh, but, you know, it was going to happen in the end. But he says at one he point, believes that... Yeah, Catholicism I mean, he, has sort of become as akin to paganism, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, he's saying it's basically... time passes, that, yeah. Yeah, uh, if he says that if this means we're not going to have any more, you know, hero worship is going to get... Uh, 
uh, less important and we lose many of the things that we came to have. He's constantly defending the old uh, ways here. He's saying we shouldn't just throw them all out. Uh, but he's saying if it means that the old is completely gone and we lose these values, then I will lament it. I will say this: uh, why, <laughs> like, why God has have you left this? But I don't think this is gonna happen because I think we can reach to new new truth uh, from the old truths that are now seen paganish. And he makes his point a little bit on Knox as well, uh, but uh, you know, with the he says like if you read Knox now, you might feel like he's a brute, brutish guy who mm. believes in weird things. Uh, you know, he's uh, he's constantly like saying that modernization, if it leads to the death of old values, is. Uh, it shouldn't lead to death of the old values. It should lead to us finding new values and finding new uh, ideas about how we can reach, uh, whether it's enlightenment or more religious truths, in a sense. So, uh, yeah, I did see a lot of modernization in this chapter compared to the others. I, I, I'm not very familiar about the subtext that Carlyle might be speaking in because I sometimes get the impression that he's not really the biggest fan of the Reformation from the way he's talking. Really? Uh, so I think because I, I thought the opposite. I thought there was points at where he he's he was anticipating the argument that's going to come back from those who did, don't like the Reformation, and he's going to be going, no, 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 hang on. This was a process through which hero worship doesn't die here. I actually have a paragraph here, and um, where he. I think it's him anticipating the arguments going to come back at him go, you're saying here Luther's a great man. Luther is an agent of unleashing chaos. He is somebody who thinks every man is now king. Uh, you know, all you need is the Bible, the uprooting of structure, the uprooting of natural hierarchies. How are you going to have heroes king anymore? And Carlisle's trying to anticipate that argument and then say, no, that's not so. At first view, it might seem as if Protestantism were entirely destructive to this that we call hero worship and represent as the basis of all possible good, religious or social for mankind. One often hears it said that Protestantism introduced a new era, radically different from any the world had ever seen before, the era of private judgment, as they call it. But this revolt against the Pope, every man become his own Pope, and learnt, among other things, that he must never trust any Pope or spiritual hero captain anymore. This is him trying to anticipate the argument. Whereby is not spiritual union, all hierarchy and subordination among men, henceforth an impossibility, so we hear it said. Now, I need not deny that Protestantism was a revolt against spiritual sovereignties, popes and much else. Nay, I will grant the English Puritanism revolt against earthly sovereignties, and was the second act of it. But the enormous French Revolution itself was the third act, whereby all sovereignties, earthly and spiritual, were, as might seem, abolished uh, or made short of abolition. Protestantism is the grand root from which our whole su subsequent European history branches out. And actually, I was trying to compare notes in Luther to this uh, book, which I've only begun. It's called uh, From Dawn to De Decadence by Jacques Barzun. It was written in the late 90s. It's got an interesting take on Luther, um, but it, he also pinpoints Protestantism as the beginning of the European history, as Carlyle was saying there. Um, but Carlyle back after saying all that, then he bounces back and says, no, 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 I find it to be a revolt against false sovereigns, the painful but indisputable first preparative for true sovereigns getting in place among us. So he's really like, no, the revolt was justified because there were false sovereigns. And again, in the French Revolution, he picks at this where he's saying Louis XVI and that aristocratic lens in France were decadent. Uh, it doesn't mean he's against aristocrats full stop because he writes his great... Uh, biography of Frederick the Great, who overlapped much of that late French aristocratic era. And he thinks Frederick the Great is a terrific example of a leader. So he just thinks it's false semblance, false worship. Catholicism had entered a mode whereby people were worshipping by semblance and by formula rather than by true belief. And Luther comes in and reinvigorates that with a sense of a man who whose belief encompasses his whole being. And he says Muhammad was the same. This belief is his whole being. It is not this little thing that he does on a Sunday. This being Easter Sunday as well. It's not this thing you just do. It's not just this act you, you're performing. You are thinking and being and inhabiting it wholly. 
yeah, sincerity, I think, is the heart of this chapter. I think I said that before as well. But yeah, sincerity is... No, I actually said that somewhere else. Yeah, I actually had a very similar conversation to this yesterday. I do like this book club on Asian uh, philosophy on another Discord. We were talking about uh, basically Confucianism as opposed to Taoism. And in Confucianism, you're supposed to take your social roles, your work, your labor, and your uh, familial relations and be completely committed to them. You must be sincere in what you're telling other people, what you're uh, acting in your own self. So we were having that conversation and I said, you know, sincerity is in a way the heart of Confucianism. And in a sense, uh, in this chapter, uh, what Carlyle is putting forward is basically the very same thing. He says that uh, if you truly believe uh, within a, if you believe in a truth that you, that uh, simulates you into action, uh, then your actions will be true and you will uh, achieve great things. But if you don't believe it, if you are simply uh, trying to get at gains or if you are simply... I can actually quote uh, it, I believe. And that's why, the, the, to link that back to Luther, that's why this yeah. uh, Joseph Texel is the person who's sent to to bring these to gather these indulgences in Wittenberg, and that's the trigger event. I mean, he, he builds up a bit of Luther's life before then. He has the conversion yeah. to go into the the monastery with the lightning storm, which again is yes. You know, Carl, I would have loved that imagery, but yeah. it's yes, he says that it's the money. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. He says that a great man was said was always sincere, as the first condition of him. But a man need not to be great in order to be sincere. That is not the necessity of nature and all time, but only of certain corrupt, unfortunate epochs of time. A man can believe and make his own in the most genuine way what he has received from another, with boundless gratitude to that other. The merit of originality is not novelty, it is sincerity. This is interesting. And uh, he also, in a previous one, he says, like, you know, if you act without sincerity, obviously you're going to be just working towards destruction. And in a sense, he is saying here that, you know, you don't have to be obviously a great person to be sincere uh, in order to live in accordance with uh, what is true in your own uh, epoch and time. Uh, Carlyle does differentiate between something that's true now or, uh, as opposed to something that was true 500 years ago. So, yeah, Carlyle thinks that it constantly changes, but in the sense, uh, the, that time's truth, in a sense, doesn't change the current times uh, truth that someone lives in doesn't change. And being sincere uh, for Carlyle means that you are, uh, you are in relation to that truth. Whether you are a, for, a reformationist within a chaos, chaotic, uh, you know, corrupted time, like what he's describing here, he says that, you know, you don't have to be great, but if it's like a chaotic and corrupt society and time, you might have to be great in order to be sincere. And what uh, brings such great works and such great ideas to the forefront is not novelty, but it is sincerity. Yeah, I'm not so sure I believe what he's uh, putting forth there about an unchanging truth within one uh, simple time. Uh, I kind of feel like it's a bit strange that he is making a difference between what is true within like 500 years ago and what, in, what is true now as opposed to making a difference in what is true within one situation as opposed to another. Or well, like a, let's, you can think about it like, yeah. um, what is these, Foucault has these epistemes, right? Or these truth regimes yeah. that someone living in 1200 would have thought that the earth was in the center of the universe and that was a truth for them. But it is not one of these truths that straddles different epistemes or epochs. I think what, I'm, I'm adding language Carlyle would have been unfamiliar with ultimately, but I think that's what he's saying is truth that transcends different epistemes. Whereas that, that, that idea of the earth being in the center of the universe was a truth for people, yeah. but it was not one of these ones that Carlyle is getting at, ones that can transcend. Um, whereas other ideas like uh, Thomas Aquinas's reconciliation of Catholicism with the Aristotelian values that doesn't get picked apart as easy as other doctrines. You know, that, that one transcends in many ways parts 
of this whole reformation and everything like that. And but it, you're touching upon this the need for sincerity in Carlyle's view is very interesting because there's a great absence of a name here called Erasmus. And if I look at um, this guy, Dawn yeah. Decadence, the first few chapters of this are just, it's its a dualism. It's Erasmus versus Luther almost. Where Eras Luther was the strong man, says Barzun. Erasmus, the intellectual. Therefore, the good, he says, well, therefore you'll say the good came out of rebellion we owe to the strong man. No, summary could be falser, says Barzun. But I have a feeling Carlyle would say, no, that's entirely true. Uh, Erasmus was courageous, independent fighter, as easily roused to anger. Erasmus was the great scholar, had more wit and a different kind of literary genius than Luther. He himself was a monk made into one against his will, but he's known for his praise of folly. This idea, it's, it's a ridicule. It, Erasmus was could have these moments of satire, these moments of not being serious or genuine. Absolutely impossible uh, to be a character like Luther. Everyone he disagreed with was devils, um, or were the, saying the words of the devil. You know, at the Diet of Wor Worms in 1521, he said that those who were against him were saying the words of the devil against him. This guy is an absolute firebrand is the word I have for him, but just, yeah, just pure, spirit of I and mean, i think he was known to be quite vulgar in some of his speeches as well luther but no, you can't imagine a more sincere man whereas erasmus even at the beginning would have had interest in what luther was saying i think erasmus had his doubts about certain aspects of the catholic church the indulgences the uh, hierarchical system he declined uh, to become a cardinal twice so he clearly didn't want himself to be in that uh milieu you know he thought there was corruption around rome but then once he saw how far luther was going he goes no i'm not going to go that far and um, whereas carlisle would look at an erasmus and say there's a lack of sincerity there even yeah. though as someone like barzun and the intellectual type i think has possibly more sympathy for an erasmus than a luther carlisle sides with the luther yeah what do you think because uh yeah like you said uh do you think, like Carlyle, that Erasmus, since he was not as sincere, did not have actually contributed to the chaos rather than uh, helped it, uh, help like the argument itself? Or do you think that uh, Luther was the... I mean, Luther was more contributable to the chaos, of course. Yeah. Uh, is the but explosion. Do you think, like Erasmus uh, just uh, useless? the guy because you know or like not he, just he uses, failed but... to be the great man he failed to be the great man by going away into his books writing some little praise of folly now there's other ways of looking at it um his influence through his writings could have had effect yada 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 yeah. but for i'm just looking at carlisle's perspective no erasmus failed to be the great man great man perhaps there was a moment there opening up for him but it was not in him to be the luther to be the one that the captivator and then luther unleashes the chaos we're not saying Luther is going to be, in Carlyle's mind, he is definitely below a uh, a Cromwell or Napoleon that we'll get to later, because you see great unleashings of, of parts of Protestantism, even Carlyle's going, this is getting ridiculous. Think of the Munster Rebellion, right? Was that 1534? So it comes... So the Treaty 95 Theses is 1517, Diet of Worms, 1521. And then you have like peasant rebellions in Germany, 1524 or five. The sack of Rome, 1527 is quite important. That's seen as like the final, Ger most of the people who sacked Rome were German um, mercenaries and they ruined it as a scholarly center in the Renaissance. And this is also all leads in to Carlyle's view that there was this decadence, there was this part of Rome which was needed to be torn asunder. But then by 13... 1534, this Munster Rebellion, you have these Anabaptists seizing Munster, wanting to do their own Protestant view. And I think it's like there's polygamy and there's all sorts of uh, craziness happening. And it basically becomes <laughs> like a dark age, little town with the warlords, I think, by the end. Insane. Um, do you think that's Luther what unleashes the energy means when he's talking about uh, immortal worshipping his fetish? There's this weird section Possibly. in the text that I couldn't, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I couldn't quite understand what he says He says in this text. I didn't even know that the word fetish existed back then. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing it in an old text. But the poorest mortal worshipping his fetish while his heart is full of it may be an object of pity, of contempt and avoidance, if you will, but cannot surely be an object of hatred, 
Let his heart be honestly full of it, the whole space of his dark, narrow mind illuminated thereby. In one word, let him entirely believe in his fetish. It will then be, I should say, <laughs> if not well with him, yet as well as it can readily be made to be, and you will leave him alone, unmolested there. What's up? <laughs> What's going on? There? I don't. Uh, that, I don't think he's talking about monster there. I think he's just talking about. I'm not sure. I need to hear it again. I think like maybe a, about... a cult within like a village. <laughs> yeah, perhaps he's uh, thinking of the sure. Albigensian heresy, which happened earlier. Um, this more middle age heresies, where I think they were. It's hard to know how much ended up being Catholic propaganda. Uh, or you know, from Rome to say these people were just completely self-indulgent, uh, yeah, the, the pure the pleasure Roman seekers. Orgies, uh, there was probably uh, an element of truth to it, but you know, th yeah. that's what he's saying. I think he, let's say he's talking about Albigensian heresy. That makes the most sense to me there. Um, which was yeah, Middle Age. It was happening in the south of France with the Cathars, and they, they yeah, they they. I think there was rumors. You know, they had these great pleasure feasts and all that sort of stuff. And perhaps that's why um, Carlyle thinks it doesn't kick off. I mean, the usual reason is the printing press, right? Luther's Reformation kicks off because of the printing press, the spread of word. You get to have the the, the mad man with his zealotry and his idolatry wanting to get rid of semblance now has the vehicle. He has this thing which he can, he has the speeches, but then when the speech ends, the crowd goes home. But now the crowd can go home with a pamphlet in their hand yeah, and, and can continue the energy. Yeah. But Carlisle Definitely, may be there and saying, like, yeah. He makes the point that, you know, Luther, just one guy who is like uh, in a position within a sect, he can do something uh, with the help of the printing press. He can start a movement that will affect the entire globe. And he loves like pointing that out. He, he says like this, uh, in a sense, he doesn't, uh, he credits uh, Luther's own like strength uh, more than the printing press almost, but he keeps on like pointing out that this guy who had like a uh, poor childhood, yeah. he was uh, unlikely bringing, you know, uh, bringing up, he had the bag as a child. He also talks about the poor childhood of Knox like, as well. Yeah, yeah uh, he been came appealed from to that him, yeah. to like change the entire landscape of uh, European culture, which is... Uh, which is another reason why he is so adamant about like pointing out uh, Luther as a hero and a reformer, you know. Uh, no, it's true. I, I, I mentioned the printing press there because, again, like Erasmus, notable by its absence here. If you read a modern take on the Reformation, it's everywhere. It's like, well, you could say it's our technocratic um, vantage point that, that so many modern writers, or contemporary writers, I should say, today we'll try and write something from it's it's pure jared diamond right james guns and steel it's okay it was this mechanism that forced everything whereas carlisle is much more no it's the man and he, <laughs> he talks about the printing press it's nowhere in this whole thing um i think it definitely has its support but as i said the, the the man can give this big speech but now we can go home with the and it's, just, it's the same with them um, with the advent of the radio in the 20th century, where now the speech can be broadcast to everyone. I think there's this picture of, of an old Labour, uh, one of the early Labour MPs called Ker Hardy, um, giving a speech in uh, Trafalgar Square. And he's not using, he's got no megaphone. He's got one of the last speeches is early 20th century. And you just get the sense of how different it was to have to listen to a politician give a big speech back then because they had to just carry their voice. Whereas once you have the radio, then everyone could just sit at home and listen to you. Same thing with the pamphlet. Definitely. Uh, Carlyle does omit quite a bit of things to make his heroes seem like almost divine, uh, divinely ordained in a sense. Uh, I'm not sure if like you like that stylistic choice, but uh, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of the way he is sort of approaching certain things. I mentioned sincerity. I don't think like being insincere uh or less than completely sincere is i find it, i actually really like hate. it as an appeal i like it as an appeal but i think our age is is very insincere age and um, ultimately you can't be on a, a whatsapp chat group or something without you know someone adding in some sort of like little ironic emoji or there's a little or even the lol expression right all these expressions are sort of insincere expressions you cannot imagine a luther 
messaging anyone, even though he had a pamphlet, right? He could have entered his own lingua. His lingua was not one of the lols or the emojis. <laughs> um, I, 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 so I admire it as an ideal, but I realize I'm far too infected by, by the age I live in <laughs> to, to truly be considered a Luther or anything like this. Uh, we should talk then about Knox as well, because we talked about how yeah, uh, this is a chapter where Carlyle is talking about the unleashing of the chaos. And it'll be very interesting to, to do a Cromwell after this, because how does Carlyle see the, the, the bow being retied? Or maybe the, how do you retie Gordian's knot if it's been chopped in half? Um, so how but, did you think that Knox uh, was sort of a reformer in a sense as a priest? He, because uh, usually you would think of, he would think of Luther as a reformer because he started the Reformation, but you don't hmm. think of Knox as the reformer because he's a Puritan. Like a Puritan, usually you usually think of a Puritan as someone who is like uh, as rule bound as a Confucius uh, like scholar. You would think like he is completely. Uh, you should be completely. Uh, you should give yourself to the rules completely. You shouldn't break them. You should. Uh, it's kind of like fundamental Islam <laughs> of the 18th century. Yeah, uh, yeah. but century. there's this weird, there's a weird lead in Carlyle does where he says, uh, you know, in Luther's own country, Protestantism devolved. I and mean, there I think he's talking about the Munster uh, rebellions and, and acts such as this throughout the 16th century. Uh, but in, in my own Scotland, <laughs> you know, there's a bit of like, he, he's been brought up to worship Knox, I think, to worship this Presbyterianism that it, uh, Rome in, in Scotland. So he will say like, oh, Scotland was the only place that really took this Protestantism and, and drove it to its proper conclusion. Everywhere else devolved into chaos and madness. And it was only through Knox that we saw it, that this Scottish Presbyterianism seems to, and this is what we're talking about, you know, Knox had great exposure to Calvin in his time. So you have the Scottishness of Carlisle coming through, maybe even subconsciously, this admiration because he was, would have been so affected with it at a young age. Um, so I don't take that as sincere. I, I don't take his view that Knox did something great that everyone else didn't, that other Protestant reformers like Swingley didn't do. Or, you know, It's just because it was in Scotland and Carlisle grew up with it that he takes a notion to it. Nevertheless, there is some interesting bits to to his, his passages on Knox. He's obsessed with Knox Knox's period as the galley slave. Uh, it comes up in the French Revolution as well, where he goes back to say, I think someone was a galley slave, one of the uh, people who came up from Marseille, right, to do the Marseillais. And he, and he just throws in Knox again. It's like, they were just like Knox, who, who rowing, beating hard against the Seine or, you know, wherever he was a galley slave for the years he was. Uh, as if, there, again, it was this idea of labor. It concentrated his mind to his proper vocation, which was to go back to Scotland and to, yeah, to permeate the court of Mary, Queen of Scots, to assert his Presbyterianism. Um, and there's a, there was a line that I think particularly stood out. He sees Knox as a savior of Scotland from becoming simply a man who did not wish to see his land become a hunting field for the Guises. So the Guises were like this French nobility who were marrying into Scotland. And there was trouble that Scotland could simply become their domain. And he sees Knox as a bulwark against that. And it's a, and he gives a spiritual weight to it, I suppose. That's what I kind of got from his little Knox passage at the end. I don't know if you've got anything else. Yeah, Knox is almost like an add-on to this essay. He's only appears like, I believe... Uh... Like it's kind of like what Dante is, though, to the Shakespeare one, I would say. Uh, I would say that Dante at least had, like, a presence a prelude, that's, rather like, than the, uh, yeah, the epilogue. If you were to, like, remove Knox from this chapter, you can still have a uh, hero as priest. I don't think you can have that with Shakespeare and Dante. I think Dante, uh, even at some points, his qualities defined Shakespeare later on when uh, Shakespeare was shown to get over them. It, Knox feels like an add-on in this chapter because he's uh, technically not even like what you think of when you think of a reforma uh, reformer. He seems to be just this guy that uh, Carlyle was very impressed by as a priest. 
So he wanted to give him in this chapter that uh, well, he brought Presbyterianism to, to Scotland. Yeah. though, I would say, and and I think it's yeah. this this Presbyterianism, this created creation of the Presbyter, these ideas that Knox got from Calvin that that Carlyle likes because you were able to create order from the chaos. Knox creates the order of the Presbyter in Scotland, which calms down the situation, if you know what I mean. That it the Presbyter and the, the whole institution of it is what works in reality. It is not this simply a formula or something that unleashes more chaos. It actually works as a, as a method to get people learning under the new religious Protestant um, Protestant way of life, but actually doing so in reality with genuine institutions. That's part of his yeah, admiration. So he, yeah, so he's putting him forward as someone who is sort of bringing his culture back from decadence in a sense. While you might not think of like- Luther, Or from being a vassalage as well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Scotland's so particular case, yeah. Yeah, so even though like a modern person might not think of uh, the Puritans as basically uh, reformers, it would still be a reformer according to the what was the most sincere notion to go from at that time. And yeah, I think uh, that can lead us back to what he, uh, he, he usually end these uh, episodes on the last uh, paragraph almost because the last paragraph usually summarizes what he, uh, what the author wants to get across. The last paragraph of this essay doesn't do that, I think. At least doesn't do it as well. I think the one before the last paragraph does it the best. So I'll just read that. And if you sure. want to read the last paragraph, you can do that as well. But the right, that right and truth or God's law reigns supreme among men, Carlyle says. This is the heavenly ideal, well named in Knox's time and nameable in all times, a revealed will of God, toward which the reformer will insist that all be more and more approximated. All true reformers, as I said, are by nature of them priests and strive for a theocracy. So we can end on what we think of what we what he's saying here, because, you know, he says that uh, usually people think of Knox. Uh, I think he says this about Knox or Luther. I don't quite remember, but he says that the problem with them was that they were going for uh, Knox was going for a theocracy of someone who has to have the priest's uh, permission to act. A king has to have the priest's permission to act. So uh, he says that yes. this is, in a sense... They, 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 uh, they talk to kings as if they were children, is one of the lines yeah. he has, isn't it? Yeah. And he says that this is normal. That every priest and every reformer is trying to go for and striving for a theocracy. Uh, what do you think of that? Is that... Knox is definitely going for a theocracy. I suppose Luther is yeah. as well, but the, the Holy Roman Empire is so muddled. It's less like, you know, you're dealing with princes and you don't have this coherent king. I mean, he was never going to win over Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, for instance. So it's harder to equate Lutheranism, Lutheranism to yeah. that. I'll just finish on this, though. You talked about Puritanisms a bit. The Puritan is the English Puritan, which comes slightly later than Knox. Knox is the influence on it, the Presbyter. Oh. Um, so I'm not very knowledgeable. But it's okay. The, there's an overlap, yeah. uh, you know. But you talk of you think of Puritanism, you think of an English Puritan. But what well, that's leading perfectly into is the setup for Cromwell, right? You can see that we're finishing this conversation, but we haven't bottled the chaos. We haven't restored to a piece of order that Carlyle always wants to long for. So he's created these two heroes, Knox and Luther, but they aren't the heroes to put a, a, a seal on the events. That has to be the, ne the next stage, which is the Puritan stage, and the Puritan stage that creates its own king in Cromwell. So unless you have any other parting words, I'll leave it there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I didn't catch that last part. Sorry. But, Just that uh, we're, pre we're prepping for Cromwell. <laughs> yeah, it. we're prepping He's for gonna Cromwell. He's going to be the one. That's the He's going to be the one that embodies the, the kingship of this whole movement. Everything yeah, can uh, filter back into the one man. All right. Till next right, time, guys. Well, uh, 
I guess we'll talk about sincerity more in the next few uh, chapters since uh, Carlyle introduced it wholesale within this uh, within this chapter, like as the thing you need as a somewhat mm. reformer or a, not sure how it relates to the overall idea of the hero. But I think at this point, uh, he does mention that the hero also needs to be sincere and hero worship cannot be towards insincere people. Uh, he mentions that in this chapter. But yeah, we'll talk about that more uh, as we're going into Hero as King. And see ya, I guess. See you then, guys.